um, talking about some assembly required as we, as we walk through um, relationships. And uh, one of the things that we see just in our society um, is we see children, I want, I want you to hear me this morning, we see children running, governing, ruling their homes. Um, you can see it um, in how children are disrespectful and selfish and undisciplined, and, and we see that in our society all the time. We see that in, in different things. We see that sometimes as given accolade because all oh, they're being independent and all those pieces. And, and I, want our, I want our sons and our daughters to be independent, yes, but you know something? There is a place and there's a way in which it, which it occurs. And um, so... Um, when, when we start talking about that, sadly, even in our churches, not in the Destiny Center, of course, but I need to make sure I talk about it, right? But sadly, even in the churches, uh, we see this sometimes playing out. But I, I want to tell you this. It's not God's plan for your children to rule your home. It's not God's plan. Yeah, but it makes it easy. No, it makes it easy today, but it's gonna, you're going to have hell to pay for later. Pardon my language. I just need you to understand that. I need you to understand the extent of that. Because if we're not careful, that's where they'll end up. And so um, it's not God's plan. And I'll just tell you right now, it is not a good parenting strategy. Um, and so this morning, I, I want to take just a few moments um, to talk about this. See, in Scripture, we see several examples of children um, that run the home. In Judges 13, 14, and 15, we see the story of Samson. He was a judge. He was anointed by God. But can I tell you something? The problem was is he, he ran the family. He didn't do the things that God called him to do, and mom and dad wouldn't tell him no. And he ended up paying the consequences to it later. He ends up in captivity, blinded, bound, and yet God does give him strength one more time, but he has to kill himself in order for God to get glory. And I say he killed himself. It wasn't in a sense suicide. He was just in, in the matter of that moment. Um, we even see David, who was an outstanding king, the greatest king, uh, I would say, just short of Christ himself, okay? So, but I, he's a great king. I love the stories of David. I love to, to hear about all the, thing, all the things that he did when he defeats Goliath. Don't we just go, oh, how awesome. And we go out and start practicing our slingshot. Anyway, uh, well, maybe y'all don't. That's what I do. Uh, but he was a great king. But you know something? He failed in many areas as a father. Because of his lack of parenting. There was a moment, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that we see in Scripture where he had a, his son raped one of his daughters. They were, they were stepsisters, step, or stepkids, however that, you know what I'm saying. He didn't do anything about it. But years later, two years later, his other son, Tamar's sister, comes along and kills Amnon for raping his sister. And, he, and, and David should have stepped, but you want know something? Later on, Absalom in, ends up committing treason and trying to get David's throne. When children rule, we're out of our order. Um, one other, and this is where I want to go to the passage this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 22 through 34, uh, or actually 22 through uh, 29. I just scared them back there. They're like, we don't have 34. Uh, that's in my notes, and I didn't change that in my notes. But... In, in 1 Samuel, we see the story of Eli. Eli is a priest, the priest of Israel. He is the, uh, if, if just to bring it down to sometimes our terminology here, um, he is the pastor of Israel. He's the pastor of the house. And here he is, and we pick it up in verse 22. It says, now Eli was very old. He heard about everything his sons were doing uh, to all Israel and how they were sleeping with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Well, I'll just tell you something. If you don't know, that's wrong. That's not right. Um, um, he said to them, why are you doing these things? I've heard about your evil actions from all these people. No, my sons, the report I hear from the Lord's people is not good. If a man sins against another man, God can intercede for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to their father since the Lord, intent, since the Lord intended to kill them. That, that, that's, uh, that little phrase at the end of that verse, uh, since the Lord intended to kill them, uh, 
I brought you into this world and I can take you out. No, but by contrast, it says this, the boy Samuel, who's not his son, but he, he was trained up under Eli. But by contrast, Samuel grew in stature and in favor of the Lord and with men. Verse 27. Now listen, I, I'm, I'm setting the stage or setting up an example of children ruling their home and what, what ends up happening when children's rule. It says, verse 27, a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says, didn't I reveal myself to your ancestral house when it was in Egypt and belonged to, the, to Pharaoh's palace? I selected your house from the tribes of Israel to be priest, to offer sacrifices on the altar, to burn incense and to wear the ephod in my presence. I also gave your house... Uh, all the Israelite fire, uh, fire offerings. Why then do all, do all of you despise my sufferings and off- sacrifices and offerings that I require at my place of worship? And, and get this verse. I, you have honored your sons more than me. I want to take the time to minister on this thought when children rule. Uh, can I encourage you or tell you something this morning? When we fail as parents to create boundaries and order for our sons and our daughters, we dishonor God. Now, listen, I'm talking about some assembly required. Hey, have you ever had, uh, sometimes you go buy a little thing and it's just two or three pieces and you pop it together and, oh, it's nice. Some things you buy and it's instructions this long, and you have to have 1,200 different tools. So you got to go to Home Depot. Uh, you got to go to Home Depot to buy, you know, about five of them. And that, isn't that what we do, Scott? We just go to Home Depot. Oh, I didn't need that. And, um, and it takes time. It takes patience. It takes a lot of things to get that thing done. And can I tell you something this morning? When we start talking about some assembly required, and we start talking about our children, it's, it's not just a one-day process. It's not a two-day. It's, it's, it's a... It's a long process. And so this morning, I want to take just a few moments to minister on this thought when children rule. Father, help me. Father, help us. Lord, help us to hear and help us to see and help us to understand. Lord, I have sensed your presence this morning. And Lord, now I'm asking that your presence would come and anoint me to help me to effectively and correctly communicate your heart today. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your precious name. And everybody that believed it said, Amen. Amen. All right, so four thoughts here. One, um, when children rule, the family is out of order. I'm going to show, show scripture of that in just a moment. But when children rule, now, now you go, well, nobody, nobody rules my house. I rule my house. Well, let me just tell you, let, let me tell you if they rule your house. If you go to Walmart and you go into the line and they want something and you don't give it to them and they throw a fit and throw on the floor and you give in to them, they rule your house. That's the truth. Training always happens. Either they're training you or we're training them. It, it's just that way. I mean, it's, there's nothing you do. The way that you're driving down the road, you're training them. Ah, oh, you stupid driver. You're training them. So when they look at you and go, you're a stupid driver, dad. Where'd you get that? Oh, you said that about five miles back to that other guy who just, who did what you just did. Oh, come on now. Somebody's got to pray, say amen at that one. That was some good preaching right there. Right. Uh, hey, listen, I'm not here. I, 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 and this has been my prayer this morning. Lord, I don't want to be harsh. I don't want to be, I don't want to be condemning. I don't want to be any of those things. But yet at the same time, I know that I, there's things that I've got to say today that everybody's like, oh, way to go, Pastor Scott. That's awesome. I like that. But some assembly is required. So when children rule, the family's out of order. When children rule, it creates a toxic atmosphere in your home. I, I, I'm just telling you, um, when, when children rule, it's difficult. It's difficult for others to be around. Let me, let me just say something. If you invite people over to your house, like, oh, no, we got that. 
maybe start looking, yeah, maybe because you're, you're bathing and cleaning your house and wearing deodorant and all that stuff, but sometimes look at your home. What's, what's the situation going on in your home? And people just don't want to be at your house because your kids, that's an issue. I, I've said this many times before, and my folks are here. Growing up, my dad used to say this, and I, man, I hated it. Oh, did I hate it. Uh, kids should be seen and not heard. Anybody ever heard that before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're over 20, you've probably heard that at least once. <laughs> kids should be seen and not heard. And I, oh, I just, they, they just burned in me. But when I got older and I had kids, I said, kids should be seen and not hurt. <laughs> And it's not to be mean, it's not to, to devalue them or any of those types of things, but the idea is this, is that, you know something, our children need to be a blessing and people ought to desire to be around them and be around us. And so if, if children rule most of the time, others don't want to be around them, then this, this, is, this is a pretty uh, strong one. When children rule, they, they are selfish-minded. It's all about them. And so... Here's the thing that we have to do. As we look at this this morning, we have to understand that order has to be established. Order has to be established. And understand something. We don't have to, we don't have to go, well, it, we can do that. It doesn't work very well. But what we do is, wh- wh- where do we get our order from? Where we get our order from, all authority comes from the Father. All authority comes from God. And so we need to see where does authority come from. Well, in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. And then in Ephesians, we begin to read what Paul gives instructions to the church at Ephesus about the family. Verse 22. Five, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Um, I'll say one, one quick statement because it is not really want to go too far on this. But wives, submit to your husbands. Um, if your kids aren't minding you, are you in order? Anyway, um, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. Man, I got a lot of amens after that one. Thanks, guys. Um, he is the Savior. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands love your wives, just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So husbands don't go, yeah, because then, then she could say, well, then get on that cross. <laughs> uh, some of you will catch that later. Uh, but the point is, is uh, the, the idea is there's an order that has to be established. And Christ has given order to the church and he's given order to the family. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. It goes into this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this, this is right. All right, so, so let me ask you this question real quick. Um, and, and don't answer this. Uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a rhetorical question here. Who is he talking to when it says, children, obey your parents? Is he talking to mom and dad? He is talking to mom and dad, but he's also talking to children, right? Children. He didn't say, mom and dad, obey your mom and dad. He says, children, obey your parents. And Lord, because this is right, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. And fathers, don't stir up your children in, in ang- or don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And so as, as we look at the order, we have to establish order. In order. We have to understand where order comes from so that we can establish order so that we can live in order, right? So I, I, I've presented a, little of, uh, presented a problem. I'm trying to get us to a place where we can begin to see some answers. Listen, I can't do this in the next, and, and my clock's wrong. Man, please make sure that one's big and bright up there. Uh, the, the big round one up there is wrong, uh, and I keep looking at it. Uh, I, but in 30 minutes, can I tell you something? I don't have time to tell you everything. You, you are going to have to do some things on your own. Sorry. Now, if you want to pay me $125 an hour and let me put PhD at the end of my name, then, then we'll talk for an hour. <laughs> Now, you know, but, but we have to understand the problem most of the time is not our children's lack of obedience. It's our lack of training as parents. Now, now listen, some of you go, well, my kids are moved out and, and, uh, and don't, don't tune me out. Listen, because I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm going to say something this morning that's going to spark something in your spirit. And if nothing else, it's going to spark you to pray either for your children or for the, for the parents that are, uh, that are here that have young children. Uh, man, it, isn't this a mindset? Just think for just a moment. When we had young kids, we just thought, oh, when they just get old enough so I can just sleep. 
<laughs> oh, when you finally can get in school and I can have a few moments. <laughs> When they finally, and, and that's the thing that we always learn. We, oh, when summer gets here, it'll slow down. And I'll go, oh, when school gets here, we'll get into routine and it'll slow down. And can I tell you something? Uh, 29 years later, it still seems like we're running. And we don't have to worry about getting ready for school. We don't have to worry about any of those things. And we're still just zoom. And, and what happens is, is, is we get into this state of mind that if I can just get to the next place and we forget to enjoy the moment that we're in. Now, here's where we normally, here's where we normally remember it. Dun, 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 dun. You know, when they're walking across the stage. I, I, that was the wrong song, I think. That was for the president. <laughs> I remember him when he was just a wee little lad. That wrong song. Uh, but you know, when they're walking across the stage, right, at graduation, we're like, where'd the years go? Well, you were pushing them. Oh, I wish these, so hurry up and get over so I can get to this place. And so don't, so don't run through them so fast. Please don't run through them so fast because you can't cut, get them back. They don't come back. At least not to, you know, there's times, well, never mind, I won't say anything about Ryan because there's, there is video proof of, him being a little boy. Uh, but anyway, uh, but the problem most of the time is not the children lack, is their lack of obedience, our lack of training. So Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Train up, though, uh, gives us this picture. Train up gives us this picture of, of fences or boundaries. And when I train up a child, I give them the boundaries and the fences in which they should live in. Well, what if they test those fences? That's fine. Just keep that, keep that fence line intact. Don't try to buy the next person's property so you can extend your bo- boundaries or your borders. Keep train them up. It's difficult. It's not easy. When I think of the word train, I think of a lot of, uh, I think of my own personal life and, and all the training that I went through in football. Can I tell you something? There was days that I hated running. Oh, did I hate it. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. In fact, I remember when I was in, I was in college, my freshman year in college, I was so homesick and so beat up. I remember walking to practice. We had to walk almost a mile to go to practice. That, I mean, I went to such a small school, we had to go steal people's property to practice. Not true, <laughs> almost. But we walked, it seemed like a mile, maybe five miles uphill both ways. I don't remember. But I, I, remember, I remember this, and, and somebody's, somebody's going to laugh at this. Uh, maybe not. I did. I, but I remember I was homesick. I was tired of getting beat up. I was just, it was two days, we actually, we were doing three days, and I remember, and I'm like, God, if you want me to, I'll even go to Sagu, <laughs> as if that was a consolation, uh, and, and the point is, is, uh, is in that training, it's difficult sometimes, and we do some of those things that we don't like to do, because knowing that if we'll do that, it's going to get us to the place that we desire to be. And when we start talking about children, we start talking about our families, we start talking about relationships, some assembly is, is underlined real big, required. Um, so how do we train them up? Uh, I've got seven C's, and I do not know why my notes have not done right today, but anyway, uh, we, we have seven C's. The first one is, and we hit on this last week, we have to communicate. You have to talk to your kids. You have to say, no, we don't live like that. No, we don't do that. No, this is what I'm expecting. This is what I'm anticipating for you to do. We have to communicate. Don't think they're going to get it by osmosis. Don't think they're going to get it just, well, because I'm so good at what I do. Listen, David was an outstanding king, but he was not a very good father. Eli was the priest, heard from God, was directed and ordained by God, and yet there came a place where he honored his sons greater than he honored God. 
And so we have to communicate. The second C is this, conviction. You and I have to have a conviction about something. In fact, you've heard this old adage, if we, if we stand for nothing, we'll fall for anything. Have you heard that before? Well, let me add a little bit to it. If we stand for nothing, our kids will fall for everything. Because they don't know where to stand. They don't know where to go. They're trying to figure it out. And this is one thing that I've noticed uh, about children today. They're facing things in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade that we didn't face until we were in college. That's a scheme of the enemy. It's an attack of the enemy. So what are we going to do? Well, I, I made it through. Yes, you made it through because you were 18 years old when you began to make the decision of how this relationship's going to look and work. They're in the fifth grade trying to determine how does this relationship supposed to work because that's how our society has gone to. Everything's speeding up. Everything's, you got to be older than you are. But if we stand for nothing, our kids will fall for everything because they're looking to, they're trying to grasp on to whatever they think is going to be a truth or to be a stability for them. And so you and I have to have convictions. Well, I don't get a backbone. Because you, you and I have, have an anointing. You and I have, have a place. We have the order. We have the authority. Um, the third C is this consistency. And, and if there's anyone that, that I could stand up here and maybe jump up and down on, it would be this one. Consistency. Be consistent. Um, we cannot be wishy-washy about where we stand. In other words, if it's a sin today, let it be a sin tomorrow. If it's a sin today, oh, and then tomorrow, oh, isn't that cute? No, it's not cute. What you've just done is you've taught your kids it doesn't matter what you do as long as it's funny. Come on, somebody. Somebody's got to be hearing something today. Hopefully not me. I'm I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm not trying to rant too much. Um, But consistency, you and I have to be consistent. Even when it's difficult, be consistent. Even when when everything's coming against you, be consistent. The fourth C is this character. If you want them to have a strong, godly character, then we need to pursue a strong, godly character. Well, I think you ought to go to church. Then get up and take them to church. Get up. But if you want, if you, we need character and they need character, and so we've got to pursue it. Here's the other thing. It takes for us to, to raise our children, to train them up. It takes courage. To be a parent today takes a lot of courage. I I am telling you, the things that we face, that you face, it takes us being courageous to raise our children in a godly uh, manner. Society is against us. The enemy is scheming against us and, uh, and against our children. And it just takes courage for us to stand in there. But get this. Take courage. God is for us. Ah, somebody ought to get excited about that one. If you don't have anything else but this, God is for us. So it takes courage. It takes courage. In fact, um, when Joshua gets ready to go fight, uh, or doesn't get ready to fight, he gets ready to march around the walls of Jericho, God tells him, take courage. And allow the word to be the meditation of your heart. Take courage. And so we need to take courage. Um, the sixth C is this, compel. See, Scripture tells us to go and compel the lost to come to Christ, right? Mom and dads, we need to compel our sons and daughters to know Christ. Well, I don't want to force them into anything. Okay, you just do that. Because I'm going to promise you the world's going to force whatever they want down their throats. Well, uh, I'm not saying you've got to force anything. When I say compel, why don't you make Christianity, why don't you make your spiritual life attractive enough to say, you know something, I need that in my life. Well, I've really messed up. That's fine. Repent and let's get on the road. Let's, let's keep going. But we've got to compel our children. Influence is a good word there for compel, but I, I, you know, I had to go with cease. Then I came to one, and, and I really struggled with this one, but I'm going to go really, and, and my, my biblical scholar back there may, may laugh at me, but I'm going to go use a Greek word or Greek term, chronos, because it has a C. It worked well for me, right? All of these things, it takes time. And since time doesn't start with C, I had to go with Kronos. It takes time. It takes you just, you know, today was a, a, was a rough day. Come on. Let's put our big boy pants on. 
and let's go into the next day. Yesterday was rough, but today's going to be better. It just takes time. Rome was not built in a day. You're not going to raise your kids in a day. But we have to start somewhere. And so we don't, have, uh, we don't have good, godly kids by accident. I'll just tell you this. You, you should bring them to the Destiny Center. You should allow them to be uh, involved um, in our children's ministries and our youth ministries and all the areas of ministries. I, I, think, it's, I think it's an awesome opportunity for them. Uh, but listen, just because they come to that, don't expect, well, that's all we need. No. Because if you think about it, there's maybe a maximum of three hours a week. Three hours a week that they get to spend in those, in those moments. They spend eight hours a day just at school with all the other stuff going on. No one's saying school's bad. I'm not saying taking them out of school. That's not what I'm saying, but you hear what I'm saying, right? About the time. It takes time. So you and I, you and I have to realize it's going to take time, but it doesn't, things don't, don't happen by accident. So, so this morning as, as we talk about it, when kids rule, it's not about behavior modification. Uh, behavior modifications changes when, when you aren't there or the stimulus is no longer there for them to act a particular way. Right? As long as the boss is there, I'm hard at work. But when the boss is gone, hey, it's a free-for-all. That's what behavior modification does. And I'm not entirely 100% against that, but here's the problem. When the stimulus to do right is gone, and it's only behavioral modification, then they revert back. So it's not about behavior modification. It's really... A heart issue. It's a heart issue. Because it's the heart that we're after. If we can capture their heart. See, when we capture their hearts, even when they are not in our presence, they will walk in obedience. Why? Because they are motivated by love for you and hopefully motivated by love for God. We're after their hearts. And I'm, I'll tell you something today. You cannot buy their heart. Well, I'll just keep giving them all this stuff and then they'll like me. Listen, all you're doing is teaching them to be selfish and to be greedy and to think that everything that they want, they can have. That, that's, that's, that's not helping them. You're helping them rule your home. Um, so we're, we're after their hearts. We're after to capture their hearts. Uh, how, do we, how do we capture their hearts? Well, let's start right here. Instead of having all the one, two, three, four ways to do this, this is, this is what we need to do. We need to let God capture our heart. And if God will capture our heart, can I tell you something? He'll show us the ways to capture their hearts. And I'll just tell you right now, it has nothing to do with what they can buy you. I promise you. Um... I stand here today, and, and I can tell you, I, I grew up, I was blessed. I don't know if I had everything that I ever wanted, um, but I can't remember that I was ever in a moment that I, ever, that I was ever in need of anything, okay? Does that make sense? Um, uh, my first car was a Hyundai. <laughs> well, not really. It was a 1978 Oldsmobile. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with cars and all that stuff. I'm just saying, hey, it's not that, well, I'm going to have whatever I want. I, I'm just saying, I, I grew up, and there's things that I can walk away and say, well, I didn't get everything I wanted, but I can tell you this. That's not what motivated me to, to, to be obedient to my parents. You know what motivated me, motivated me to be obedient to my parents? My dad's black belt. <laughs> not really. That's a joke because I needed you to hear me because y'all got kind of really serious right there. Uh, no, uh, you know what motivated me? A love for them. It took a while. It took a while in, in understanding that and learning that. Because when I was young, you know what motivated me? My dad was bigger than I was in the black belt. And that, that made some behavior modification along the way. But you know what eventually changed my heart? Is that dad captured my heart. Mom and dad captured my heart. And so when I was away from them, and I knew that I wasn't supposed to do that, I'm thinking, ah, that's, no, that's not what I want to do. For one, dad might not really appreciate that, the fear factor. But two, I don't have to do that because they captured my heart. And I'll say this, if we'll allow God to capture our hearts, he'll give us the tools and the ability and the opportunity to capture their heart. 
I'm not saying everything's 100% uh, will go 100%. Well, if you do all these things, then everything's going to be perfectly okay. No, it's, it doesn't always work out that way. I don't want to be uh, like the 30-minute sitcom or the 30-minute TV show that they, they pose a problem at the beginning. At the end of it, they got all the problems and the world's problems solved. Listen, you and I know this. To raise children, it's some assembly required, and it takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes us uh, really working at this thing. But we have to capture their hearts. We can't rule or train out of fear because fear will always lead to rebellion. Fear always leads to rebellion because ultimately you get tired of feeling afraid and you stand up and you fight and you rebel against it. Well, as soon as I get out of this house, I'm going to run as far away from you as I can. I'm going to live however I want to. Sadly to say, I'll be real honest with you, sadly to say, statistics show that's what a lot of children in the church have done. They graduate and they... I I can't throw a rock. I I don't know all those situations. I don't know. I I, I just can't. I I can tell you that in in my years of experience and just obviously growing up and seeing even pastor's kids, they grow up in the church and then somewhere along the line, you're like, what's going on? And I'm not saying that they did anything wrong. I'm not saying I I don't know all the story. I don't know all the stories. I can't tell you all that. I I don't want to clump them all together, but I'm going to just tell you something. You and I have to realize it doesn't happen by accident that you and I are going to have to work. And what we have to do is we have to not, not be motivated out of fear or motivate them out of fear, but out of love. See, we train and lead motivated by love. 1 John 4, 18 and 19 says, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out, drives out fear. Because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Story of a a young girl that had been rebellious toward her parents. And uh, it was really breaking her parents' heart. And uh, the the struggle with that really kind of reached its peak at at a point when the young girl was arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol. So after mom came and posted bail and got her out of jail, um, they headed home and there wasn't much conversation. But the next afternoon they would come together and and the woman handed her daughter a small wrapped gift. And and of course the girl, um, already in a rebellious and kind of... uh, uh, against her family, against her parents, kind of flippantly is like, what, what, is, uh, what is this? And opening up this gift is kind of ticked off and, and uh, she sees in the bo- box is a small rock. And <laughs> she rolls her eyes and asks, what's this for? Can, can you see this picture? Maybe you face this picture at some level. And her mother simply replied, read the card. She, she did and was overcome by these words inside. The card said, this rock is, a more, is more than a million years old. That's how long it will take before I give up on you. And tears began to stream down her cheeks as she reached out to embrace her mom. See, God broke through to us with his unrelenting, get that, with his unrelenting love and enduring love. We would do well to use that same strategy to break through to the hearts of our, of our children. See, when children rule, the problem is that there's an order problem. The order problem comes is when we, we fail to create and establish boundaries. This is how we do this, and this is how we do this. I'm not saying that, they're, that, they all, we, that they'll always do exactly what we desire them, but there's a fence. They know, they know where it is. You know where children especially struggle? When they don't know where it is. And they spin out of control because they don't know where it is. And then we get mad at them because they're spinning out of control, but we haven't given them any boundaries or any guidelines in which to, in which to stay within those parameters. 
And you go, well, I'm going to squall, I'm going to, I'm going to squelch their creativity. Ha, no, because you give them boundaries and you give them guidelines. You're, no, what you're doing is you're buying a lie from the world. You're trying to buy, buying a lie from the enemy that says, well, if we do all these things and we, we don't let them be independent. God didn't call us to be independent. He called us to be obedient. You know something? He's going to let me be independent. He's going to let me go choose where I'm going to eat this afternoon until he doesn't. Until he says, no, I need you to go there. Man, come on, that's good. Isn't, that, isn't that ultimately what we want from our kids is for them to say yes to Jesus and to walk in obedience to him. And I'm going to just tell you something. It'll be difficult for them to walk in obedience to him if they, they fail to walk in obedience to us. It can happen. It take, it's a God thing, and God can make it happen. I, I, I agree with that and believe that. But can I tell you, we can help that situation along if we'll t- help them to be obedient. To Children, obey your parents. Most of the time, it's not because their lack of obedience. It's our lack of training. Church, it's some assembly required. Now, now, some of you are sitting in here going, oh, that doesn't have anything to do with me. Yeah, it does. It has a lot to do with you because if you sit in this church and you sit in this house, then all those kids that are running around here, they're a part of your family, and you need to be praying for these parents. Amen. You know some of the struggles. You know some of the pitfalls, and you need to be praying, Lord, let them see it. You see one of these kids running around here go, oh, that reminds me of ooh, when he was young. I'm not saying you got to go to him and go, hey, well, I... This is what, I've seen Ethan do this, and I remember my kid was like, rah, rah, rah. you don't have to go and regurgitate on them. Just stand back and pray for them. Encourage them. Go, hey, can, can, I, take, can I take Ethan to lunch so y'all can go have a date? That's right, come on. <laughs> well, well they're, they're, they're teenagers. Well, can you, can, I'll, I'll just tell you something, and, and, and I'll finish with this. Uh, I remember some of the most impactful moments. I, today, I can't remember their, I, I don't remember their names. That's my own fault. But I remember growing up, there would be men in the church that would always encourage me. They'd come, no, they didn't take me to lunch or any of those kind of things. But I'm just saying, they would encourage me. They would challenge, they, they befriended me. They, they, would, they would talk to me and say, oh, that's used. I don't have anything to do with him. They would talk to me. And I remember as I would grow up, that made an impact on my life. You and I have the ability and opportunity. You know why I mess with our youth as much as I do and I, I hug on them and I beat on them and I do all that. For one, it's fun to beat on them. But... <laughs> Isn't it, Scott? <laughs> no, I mean, I do that because, I, listen, I, I want to be in their world. Not that they do everything I exactly desire for them to do or think it's great, but I, but I want to have a relationship with them. Why? Because I want to impact their lives. I want to capture their hearts. Not so that they'll, oh, they'll be a Scottite. <laughs> but I want them to follow Christ. And I know if they'll, they'll see some men and see some women that will, as best they can. I'm not always right. There's times that I, I've had to repent. Say, man, I, I handle that a little. But the point is, if they'll see men and women following after God as best as they can, and they see that there's a genuineness and authenticity to it, then there's something that compels them and attracts them. And so, church, when children rule, When children rule, our home is not in the correct order. See, when God captures our hearts, he motivates us to train them, train them up because of our love for God and our love for children. See, we need God's help. Uh, I'll just say this. If you've been rebellious to God's word and his order, um, what you need to do is you need to repent. You need to repent. I know we don't like that word. I don't like people telling me what to do. I I know we don't like that word. But listen, if I want to walk in the blessings of God, then I have to walk in those things that he's instructed me to do and to be obedient in. How do we expect God's blessings when we're out and out rebellious toward his word? Well, I'm not rebellious. Listen, if if we're not training up our sons and our daughters, we're rebellious to the word, period. That's not, that's not according to me. That's not my, my great idea for the day. I'm telling you, that's what the Word of God shows us. So we need to repent. We need to repent. We ask the Lord to capture our heart 
and give us the ability to capture there. Understand this. God's anointed you. If you're, if, you're, if you're a parent today, God has anointed you. Well, I don't feel anointed. Well, you've got to discover it. You've got to develop it. You've got to walk in it. I, walk in it. Well, I don't know. Well, get in his word. Um, get, around, get around people that have been successful and, and you see them being successful in raising their sons and their daughters. Ask them questions. You don't have to go sit at their house for 45 hours and go, well, just, just watch. Because we're always training. Father, I pray that your spirit would challenge us and help us. Lord, I, I realize, man, when we start talking about our families, we're talking about our children, man, sometimes we walk away and feel like there's so much assembly that's still required. And Lord, that's okay. You're faithful. You, you're able. Lord, you are patient with us. And Lord, help us to get it together. Help us to walk in correct order um, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our homes. Lord, I just pray that right now the enemy would come and say, oh, you're not good enough. And the enemy might come in and try to, to make us feel overwhelmed. Lord, as the psalmist would say, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. Lord, lead me to your place. Lead me to that quiet place. Lead me to that sanctuary. Lead me to your presence. Lord, that in that place I can not only receive um, your love and your guidance and your presence and your strength, but in that place you're going to give me understanding of how to capture the hearts of our children. Lord, help us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us. And Lord, help us to start on the path. Let us start right now as best we can. Begin to build those things that are going to enable us to, to assemble relationships in our children that are godly and honoring to you. Lord, let it not be written of us or said of us. And you honored your sons more than me. Lord, we desire to honor you more than anything in your precious name. Amen.